Ace Team and here doing the junkyard crawl with a twist. This is the big Olds barn. Get it? It's an old barn, but it's full of Oldsmobiles. We're in Palmer, Massachusetts, and we'll take a break from Burns and Auto Reckon for a couple of days to explore the cool Oldsmobile products in that barn. Everyone loves a barn find. Let's dig in. This is the kind of stuff that everybody dreams of when they go into an old barn, or in this case, the Olds barn. It's an Oldsmobile. It's 1957, and you know a lot of people talk about finding a barn find, vehicles that have been indoors in a barn for their life. Well, this is the case. This truly is. It's been off the road since 1969. It's a 57 Oldsmobile. Now, of course, this is most people's impression of a 57 Oldsmobile, the big uh, four-door 98. And we can see right here, 57 final year, four single headlights, quad lamps would replace them in 1958. This is a Johan with a little gear drive deal right there. But again, this is the, uh, the little one that helps sell the big one. And this, well, this is something even more important. This is a convertible, a 1957 Olds convertible. Uh, convertibles, generally speaking, were maybe 10% of production total. Very uncommon, very rare. Uh, and you gotta remember too, the 57 Chevrolet, uh, Olds, Buick, Pontiac, all shared similar body tubs, but with very unique touches from division to division. Of course, Oldsmobile had their classic beak on the front and on top of each fender, the rocket motif. Of course, the old rocket V8 arriving in 1949, the 303 revolutionizing the Detroit horsepower scene along with the Cadillac 331. Uh, but most important, we have to know what's under the hood on this thing. This is where this thing really becomes special because this is a J2. That is the triple Rochester two barrel induction setup right there, which debuted in 1957. <clears throat> and here it is, triple carburetors atop the 370 cubic inch Olds Pushrod V8, a J257 Olds convertible. Now the wild card is this. The cowl tag will tell us all kinds of stuff about this car, but it won't tell us which engine came. It's possible the 372 barrel, the 374 barrel, or the mighty J2 in its first appearance for 1957. Now you might wonder, why would you have three carburetors on an engine? Well, if you're new to the game, you know, an engine's an air pump, and the more carburetors you have, the more air it can ingest, and the more power technically it can make. But also, by running the engine on the, on the center carb, this two-barrel carburetor right here, with progressive linkage, you get the economy of a two-barrel, but at wide open, all six barrels kick in. In fact, later on, the GM Rochester Quadrajet kind of did the same deal. Cruise around on those microscopic primaries, you know, get good fuel to come in and whoa, right there when the secondaries get, kick in. Again, a decade later, the Quadrajet came along. But for 1957, 58, and I believe 59, the J2 was Oldsmobile's top production engine offering. Of course, Pontiac had the Tri-Power along the same time. The funny thing is, the old Tri-Power induction went away after 59, I think it was, although it reappeared in 66 on the old 442W. 30 drag car. But again, if this is a factory J2 convertible, it's extra special. If it's not a J2, it's still very special. Now this is Hot Rod Magazine right here, February of 57, with Ray Brock on the cover right there, talking about engine adapters, transmission adapters right here, but most importantly, test report, old's new, 88. And of course, it was the 88 and the 98 in 57. And this one here is a 57 four-door. Uh, nothing too amazing, but again, this is the basic same uh, bones of the car we're looking at here. But again, this is a convertible, a very rare bird. And uh, I think Rock 8's kind of dug the car. His was a single exhaust four-barrel car. Uh, but again, the horsepower race in Detroit was just starting up, and I believe 315 horsepower was the number for the J2 in its top form. And we've got to remember, too, that Pontiac, also in 57, had a little something called the Bonneville, which was a convertible also, but that had fuel injection, a Rochester mechanical fuel injection. This is not that, but that said, the J2 Olds convertible is a very special car. Let's make our way along here. Now this car again has been off the road since 1969 according to the inspection sticker in Massachusetts and thank goodness you know it's pretty solid has a little bit of peppering down here you know but with that said this was 
by Warren D. I believe he bought it as a couple of year old car. And Mike D, his son, who now owns this whole uh, property, uh, used to ride in the back of this car because he was afraid to ride up front. But with that said, this is the convertible body style right here. Production numbers on these, you know, maybe 12,000 total in the 98 and the 88 model lines. But let's do something, Shane. Let's, I'm going to get where you are and we're going to look inside. It will change positions, but while I get around behind you, take a peek at that convertible top. It's still in pretty darn good condition. And I'll come up here. And yeah, this one has uh, the original plastic back glass. No problem with that. White top would have been an aqua. Looks like the original paint on this. Blue insets here. But inside, <clears throat> let's open the door. And here's the crazy thing. This is a three-speed manual. There's the clutch pedal, the brake pedal, the gas pedal. So uh, instead of the, uh, yeah, the balky and kind of sluggish hydromatic this thing would have had, this is a three-speed manual, which is to say that with that triple carbureted 370 banging gears in this thing with the shifter up on the column, yeah, there it is, would have been an interesting experience. Banging second, banging third, boiling those rear tires with the Eaton limited slip differential, uh, churning both tires, pushing you on down the road. But what a beautiful Survivor this is. The clock in the center of the dash up there, the jukebox styling above the, uh, the dash top. And again, this is not padded. That is metal. And again, there's no seat belts in this car. So with that said, this is the kind of car that wasn't very safe to drive in. But you know, America got by just fine for many years. Uh, but again, this is pretty much untouched inside. Power front seat. The switch is right down there. Very, uh, very cool. This was a loaded car. Might have been a Fiesta. I don't have any information on which model it is. I didn't bring my book to decode the, the cowl tag. So we, but it's a 57 convertible, probably a J2 three-speed manual. What a weird combo this is. And this car is for sale, by the way. There's no doubt about that. Uh, if you want to learn more about maybe buying it, I stay out of the middle. But uh, certainly Mike D, his email address is in uh, this, this video. You can call him if you want and get, a get in touch with him and find out. Now, the cool thing about this is that we look at the rear wheel on this and we can see it has the Oldsmobile rear axle, which is very different from a Chevy. Big axle. 57 was a good year. Uh, guts are good. And look at this. Left hand lug nut. See the L stamped into those? No, that's not a Mopar axle. GM actually used left hand lug nuts on Olds and I believe Pontiac. And you got to wonder why would you use left hand lug nuts? If you're Chrysler, of course, it's because you're weird. I'm kidding. Chrysler's are awesome. They're my favorite things. But this here <clears throat> is passenger car safety dynamics done by uh, a safety organization in New Hampshire. And in here, there's a little treatise on just that subject. They're doing studies in this book about things. It says vehicles with right and left hand threads of wheel fasteners. Some vehicle manufacturers utilize the safe practice of using right hand threads on studs and nuts to fasten wheels on the right side passenger and left hand threads on studs to nuts to fasten the wheels on the driver's side. Why would you do that? Well, they actually put it to the test. They dragged a car with finger tight lug nuts, a Chevy, uh, behind a wrecker and they found that pretty soon finger tight lug nuts would come off sooner with right hand than left hand lug nuts. We see right here, here's the conclusion. It was concluded that less than three out of five nuts tightened less than 10 foot pounds, and others finger tight, would cause a disconnect condition, et cetera. But the bottom line was that they found that left hand lug nuts resisted loosening more or longer than a right hand lug nut. And of course, all of that assumes you have a mechanic who puts your lug nuts on finger tight. <laughs> but with that said, uh, interesting that Oldsmobile also used left hand lug nuts on the driver's side of the car. You saw it here first, folks. But again, getting back into this car, it's a full frame car. The convertible frame has an extra X underneath it. And this thing looks to be pretty solid. Lower quarter panels are awesome on this thing. Look at that. The, the original dum-dum, that sort of asbestos or asphalt type stuff, if you will, sprayed in there to help prevent drumming. Nice lower quarters on this one. And again, the trunk's full of bits and pieces. The original light blue paint still present on the inner surfaces. And again, this is a factory convertible, uh, just a rare, rare car. And if that tri-power setup is factory or not, it doesn't really matter. It's there now. It's correct looking stuff. It's quite possible it is. But again, a three-speed manual J2, 370 cube, old convertible from 1957. What a cool car. This is the epitome of a barn find right here. And again, the car is for sale. Mike D, uh, the son of the fellow who put this together way back when or owned it, uh, is, is willing to talk to folks. So if you want to email him at the address listed here, you can find out more if you want to buy it. I stay out of the middle. doesn't matter to me. But with that said, what a cool barn find this is. Now, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe to the Steve Mag's YouTube channel. Give us a like, a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and ring the bell so you're aware when the next video comes up, which is tomorrow morning.